Welcome back guys. So last time we were looking at the job scheduling problem and a slew of greedy algorithms or potential, potentially correct greedy algorithms. And what we saw was the majority of those greedy algorithms were suboptimal or incorrect. But there were two that we couldn't come up with counterexamples for. That was earliest finish time and latest start time. We saw that those are actually strongly coupled, you know, algorithms uh, or solutions, however you want to think of it. But uh, because we were unable to come up with a counterexample, we th started to think, well, maybe this is an optimal algorithm. Well, it's not enough to just try a bunch of counterexamples, not come up with one and therefore conclude an algorithm is optimal. You have to prove it's optimal because you have to come up with a proof that says for all problem instances, this is going to return an optimal solution. It's not enough to show that it returns it for 10 specific examples. Okay. Well, before I can prove the algorithm's correct, let's actually, you know, give a definition of what the algorithm is. And that me by that, I mean, let's write out some pseudocode. So I'll take some liberties here, but I'll call my function or my algorithm EFT for earliest finish time. And if you go back to the previous video, we talked about if I prove earliest finish time correct, you know, that's true if and only if latest start time's correct. So moving forward with this lecture, we're gonna zone in and just focus in on earliest finish time, EFT. Okay, so this is going to take in a problem instance of the job scheduling problem. What does a problem instance look like? Well, I'll call it capital J, but that's just gonna be a set of jobs. So an unordered set of jobs to begin with. Okay, well, how's this algorithm gonna work? Well, I'm gonna have my solution. I'm gonna call this J with a superscript G here. It just means like a capital G for greedy, essentially. And what this is gonna be, it's gonna be the set of jobs which I return to the user. So you can think of it, this is the solution to this particular problem instance, J. And it's just gonna be a subset of J, you know, once the algorithm has run. But initially, I'm gonna initialize this thing to just be an empty set. Now here's the first liberty I'm gonna take. I'm gonna write pseudocode like this, sort, j by increasing finish time yeah increasing finish time you know and there's probably that student in the back of the room saying oh professor macchio shouldn't it be non-decreasing here yeah 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 but increasing is good enough so basically what this does is i'm changing this unordered set j and you know, can think of it as a mathematical set, no ordering imposed. And what I'm doing is I'm turning into a list. So at the beginning of the list, at the first index, we're gonna have the earliest finish time job. And at the end of the list, we're gonna have the latest finish time job. Okay, so it's now ordered by finish time, where early finish time at the start, late finish time at the end. Okay, well now I'm just gonna loop through that list and I'm gonna figure out, okay, should I add that to my solution here, JG, or should I not add that particular job to my solution? Well, what do I mean by that? Well, we're just gonna do a for loop for I equals one to N, and we'll just assume here that one's the first index of the list, and N is just gonna be the magnitude of J, or yeah, magnitude of J, the set of jobs. So I have n jobs to begin with. If you look back at the, the formal definition of the problem, that's true. Okay. So what am I gonna do here? Well, again, I'm gonna take a liberty and kind of sweep some details under the rug, but I'm gonna say, okay, if the ith job does not conflict with my current solution, JG. Meaning, okay, if the current job I'm considering doesn't conflict with any jobs I've previously added to the solution, then what am I gonna do? I'm going to add this job to my greedy solution. So I say, okay, add JI to my solution. And I do this for every single job. I go through, okay, does this job conflict with anything? No, okay, add it. Does this, this job conflict? Yes, it conflicts with the job I previously added. Okay, don't include that one. 
don't include the next one because it conflicts and so on and so forth. And maybe the next one doesn't conflict, so I add it. And I do that from the first job up to the nth job. Then what do I do? Well, pretty easy. Once that's complete, I'm just going to return my greedy solution, my set of jobs, JG. So this is the earliest finish time greedy algorithm. Hmm, okay. And what we know from last time is it wasn't easy to come up with a counterexample to prove this incorrect. But as we've discussed many times, it doesn't mean it is correct. And just looking at it, I mean, maybe you have a strong intuition that you could see why this would be correct, why this would always return an optimal schedule every single time, no matter if it's a really weird boundary problem instance. But it, it shouldn't be obvious, right? It shouldn't be, you might have an intuition for it, but a proof that this is correct shouldn't be, oh yeah, it's just trivial, you look at this and therefore it is correct. So it's not enough just you know to hand this algorithm over to your boss or your client, be like, yeah, it's gonna work. Just trust me, I have a strong intuition. No, you have to prove it, especially in an academic setting, you know, hard science requires that, that uh, evidence in the form of a mathematical proof. But before we get to that, and you know, there's a couple of hurdles we have to jump through before we actually get to the proof itself, Let's, uh, let's take a look at the complexity of this sucker here. Complexity. So there's two real main chunks of this algorithm. The first one is right here, sorting the list, or sorting the set, turning it into a list. And then the second part is the for loop. Okay. Well, what's the worst case complexity of sorting? Well, you know from your data structures and your previous algorithms courses, I can do that in n log n. What about this for loop? Well, I mean, we have to run the for loop n times, so it's at least gonna have big O n complexity, but is it worse than that? Well, you can imagine if we were to brute force this, you know, every job we consider, we have to look back at potentially every other job we added to the set. And if we were to do that brute force, I'm not gonna get into the details, but you should be able to convince yourself that if I did, like, you know, comparing the job I'm currently looking at to every single other job I potentially added to my past set, that's gonna add or come out to big O n squared complexity, so quadratic complexity. Hmm. <clears throat> well, I'm gonna leave this as an exercise for you guys. It's not too tough. Remember, you have access to the finish time and start time of each job, uh, JI, but I'll leave this as an exercise. You can actually do this for loop uh, in big O n time, meaning I can check to see if the current job conflicts with my current schedule in constant time. It's not that tough, but uh, just remember you have access to the uh, finish time information and start time information of each job. Well, what does that mean? Well, this entire algorithm runs in the max of these two things. It runs in n log n time. And if the jobs are pre-sorted for you, it actually runs in linear time. Not too bad. So as far as complexity goes, this is actually a very, very efficient algorithm. You're not going to get uh, much better than, than this. And, you know, it initially looked like a, a complex problem. I mean, uh, the brute force complexity of the job scheduling problem is exponential. So to get something like n log n is you know, a little bit shocking. Okay, so how do we prove it's correct? Well, before I get into the proof, uh, there's just, like I said, a few hurdles we have to get through and, the main, and they're basically all notation, okay? So I have to get you comfortable with some notation. What notation am I gonna use? J star. Whenever I use a star as a superscript in any way, in some way that's gonna to refer to an optimal something. In this case, when I say J star, this is gonna be an optimal schedule or solution. What's an optimal solution for the job scheduling problem? Well, it's a maximal set, so it's, you know, the largest set possible of jobs that do not conflict with each other. Okay. This one we kind of already uh, talked about here, but JG 
is going to be the solution returned by our greedy algorithm. That's what the G is kind of denoting there. Our greedy algorithm is what? It's EFT. So returned by EFT. So nothing too crazy just yet. It gets uh, not, it, it really it doesn't get crazy for this proof, but it gets a little tedious with some of the bookkeeping, but hey, that's nature of the beast here. What's the next one? J, G, I. So we still have our superscript G, but now we have a subscript I. Well, what's that gonna be? Well, that's gonna be the partial solution determined by EFT. So the partial EFT solution after considering the first I jobs. So it's basically the solution of EFT after it's made I decisions, where one decision is looking at a specific job and deciding should I include it or should I exclude it. Okay, another way you can think about it is, well, it's just gonna be JG over here after this for loops run I times, okay? So it's the partial solution and I could be anywhere from zero to N, zero meaning we haven't even entered the for loop N meaning we've you know, run this for loop n times, but it's basically what JG is going to look like after making i decisions, after having i iterations of that loop. Okay, so that's going to be my notation, and I'll keep that up here. Now I want to actually prove something. What do I want to prove? Well, I want to prove this is correct. So the general approach I'm going to take is I'm going to write down a theorem. And if I can prove that theorem correct, that's hopefully going to imply that this is a correct algorithm. Hmm. Okay, well, what's my theorem gonna look like? Well, let's see if I can remember what this is. It gets a little complicated. But I'm gonna say for all problem instances J, Okay, so this is for all problem instances. This is going to be true. Remember, J is just a set of jobs. For all problem instances, J, for all I such that, when I write S dot T dot, that means such that, uh, we're going to do for all I such that zeros less than or equal to I's less than or equal to N. So for all I in this range, there exists an n, not and. There exists an optimal solution I'll call that optimal solution J star such that such that what? Well, this is, again, I'm gonna use a term here and it's not you know, defined yet, but you'll just have to bear with me. Such that J star agrees with J G I. Okay, so for all problem instances and for all I, there exists an optimal solution that agrees with JGI. Well, in order for this you know, theorem to make sense, I have to tell you what agrees means. And maybe I should put this in quotes. But I'll define it here. So I'll say J star agrees with JGI, and it starts to look a little complicated. It's really not. It's, I mean, it's just a formal definition here. Uh, I know for some students it's hard to wrap your mind around and you get a little bit, you know, 
looks fancier than what it is. We'll talk about it after I get it written out, but just bear with me. It's not too bad, okay? Trust me. Agrees with uh, JGI, if and only if, two things. One, well, sorry, if and only if, I have to uh, do another iteration here for all. For all K between one and I, so for all k such that 1's less than or equal to k's less than or equal to i, first, if the kth job is an element of my partial solution, J G I, that's going to imply it's also in the optimal solution. I don't really need the if here. Um, that implies that that same job is an element of my optimal solution. J star. Okay, and second, if J K is not an element of my partial solution. That implies it is not an element of my optimal solution, J star. Oops. Now, like I said, this is a little dense. So what is this saying? Well, let's zone in on this agrees, first of all. Remember, JGI is a partial solution. It's basically the greedy solution after it's made the first I choices. And J star is an optimal solution. You know, it's a final, maximal, no conflict set of jobs. So when we say J star agrees with JGI, what we're really saying is, okay, this partial solution has made I decisions, right? Well, J star is going to agree with those I decisions. So maybe, I equals three. And we're just looking at the first three choices of our greedy, greedy solution. So maybe we're zoning in on JG3. And maybe it's decided to include the first job, exclude the second job, and exclude the third job. Well, that means that if J star agrees with that partial solution, it also uh, decides to include the first job, exclude the second job. And I can't remember if I said exclude or include, you know, rewind. 15 seconds and whatever I said there, I say it again. So basically it agrees with the first I choices that the greedy solution has made. Every job that it's included, the optimal solution also includes, and every job it's excluded for its first I choices, the optimal set also excludes. Okay. So let's pause there just for a moment. I forgot to mention this off the bat. There's many, many ways to prove a greedy algorithm correct. And if you check the textbook, uh, the proof's actually slightly different. They use this method of proof for uh, other job scheduling problems, but not this particular one. Uh, the reason I'm doing this particular method is in my experience, this is the most robust framework, meaning that it's not always the simplest, but uh, it works for the most problems in my experience. Uh, especially for this course, everything that uh, or lecture series, everything we're proving, you might not need this method. It might be a little bit overkill in some spots, but it will definitely, definitely work. Okay, so that's what it means for J star to agree with that. Basically, after I choices, J star made the same choices for those first I jobs. It might do something different after that, but at least for the first I choices, it agrees. So why? Is my mic getting hit there? We'll see. Why is it that this theorem is useful at all? Well, think about it this way. Look at this agrees down here. What if i equals n? Well, if i equals n, that means that there exists an optimal solution that agrees with the first n choices of the greedy solution. Well, the first n choices of the greedy solution is the full solution. So if we can show that this theorem holds, 
we can show, okay, there exists an optimal solution, an optimal set of jobs that agrees with the greedy solution, meaning that the greedy solution itself is optimal. So proving this theorem proves this greedy algorithm correct. Well, how are we going to prove this theorem correct? Well, we have a for all i, and we need to show that this theorem holds for every value of i from 0 to n. Well, have you done that in the past? When you want to prove something's true for all n or whatever, well, you're going to have to do some kind of induction. So I'm going to pause there. It is a lot to digest, I understand, and it is a little dense, but I want you guys to you know, let this mellow, let this marinate a little bit. And the proof itself, once you understand this setup, once you understand this board right here, the proof is actually a lot easier. It's just understanding this initial setup, understanding the notation. Once you have that, it really does start to fall out once you, you know, turn this crank. So I'll pause there. I'll catch you in the next video.